So the table set, foundations laid for prayer, fasting, the pursuit of God, and the Gospels. Jump right in, Matthew 4, fasting and temptation. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That is an understatement, maybe the biggest understatement in the Bible. Leads into three different temptations. We don't have time to study this in depth. I want you to see how fasting and prayer guarded Jesus and guard us when we face temptation. Fasting and praying are guards against self-gratification as we are tempted, like Jesus was tempted here, to fulfill our wants apart from God's will. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3, which we looked at earlier. And as we fast and pray, we remember that we can trust in the all-satisfying, all-sufficient goodness of the Father. Fasting is an expression that God fulfills us more than even daily bread, than food. Andrew Murray put it with this way, fasting helps express, deepens, confirms the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything, even ourselves, to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. Fasting and praying are guards against self-protection. As Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6, we're reminded, we are tempted to question God's presence and manipulate God's promises. And as we fast and pray, we remember that we can rest in the shelter of the Father's unshakable security. Finally, fasting and praying are guards against self-exaltation. Just as Jesus was tempted to turn aside from the worship of God, we are tempted to assert ourselves in the world while we rob God of his worship. And as we fast and pray, we remember that we must refuse to exchange our end-time exaltation by the Father for a right-now exaltation from a snake. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. The point is, fasting and prayer are critical in all of our lives when it comes to battles with temptation and sin. That leads to Matthew 6 and Luke 11, parallel accounts of the Lord's Prayer. We'll camp out here a bit, so let's read it in full. Jesus said, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues, at the street corners. They may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. When you pray, go into your room, shut the Torah, pray to your fathers in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Again, let's ask some key questions then here about prayer based on what Jesus just said. One, why do we pray? We pray to express the depth of our daily need for God. You look at how Jesus taught us to pray. This prayer is filled with requests for help from God. Just look at the words, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. The attitude of prayer in our hearts is clear. We need God to do things for us. We need God to do things in our lives. So prayer is an expression of our need for God. Think about football. What's the pass that a team throws when they're losing by a touchdown they only have one play left? Hail Mary, Mary, right? To be clear, an unbiblical prayer. But what's the reason for naming a play after a prayer? The whole idea is you plan the whole game, but when you don't have anything left, you need a miracle, you call in Mary to see what can happen. Now, just to be clear, we don't pray to Mary. We pray to God. And the reason why we pray to God is because we're desperate. But we don't just need him in extreme situations. We're desperate for him in every single situation in our lives. There is no activity in our lives that doesn't require a prayerful attitude. A dependence on God, desperation for himself. I think about my life. I can't be the husband God desires calls me to be, the dad God God desires calls me to be, the man, the witness, the pastor God calls me to be apart from God's help. I can't breathe apart from God's help. And neither can you. You need God for everything good in your life. This is a massive realization that I pray God opens your eyes to, either right now or in a deeper way through his word right now. You cannot carry out your marriage Parenting, your life is a single, your job, you cannot make wise decisions, you can't love and serve, you can't be the man or woman or student that God has designed you to be, experience the life God has created you to live apart from daily divine intervention. Every moment of every day is a Hail Mary in that sense. We need God. That's why we pray. Prayer is probably the most clear, critical, central expression on a daily basis, all throughout day, of the reality that we need God. We need God's grace, strength, wisdom, sustenance, peace, joy, provision for everything we do every single day. And prayer is an expression of that. Our conviction is prayer is that we can do nothing without God. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Prayer is an expression of humility. So think about this. If we're not praying, then what are we saying? We're saying that we don't need God. This is where we realize that prayerlessness at the core is pride. Prayerlessness in our lives is evidence of pride in our lives. Prayerlessness is an attitude that says, I can do this on my own, and it's not true. We even need his help to pray. That's why our confession is prayers and prayers, Lord, teach me to pray. And even this, I hope, is encouraging, comforting. Listen to the words of J.C. Ryle. Fear not, because your prayer is stammering, your words feeble, your language poor. Jesus can understand you. 
We pray to express the depth of our need for God. Second, we pray to explore the mystery of intimacy with God. So this is where I want to be careful with the first reason to pray, to express our need, because our need is not just to get stuff from God. We've talked about this. Even here, daily bread, forgiveness, leadership, deliverance, our greatest need is still not to get stuff from God. Our greatest need is to know God. But we, we miss this if we're not careful. But look at what, look at how Jesus teaches here. When you pray, don't keep, keep up empty phrases. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. God knows what you need. Think about that. So apparently God is not up in heaven with a steno pad, like writing down your request saying, oh man, I hadn't even thought about that. Like, thank you, that's a good one. Oh yes, so many things are informing me. No, no, He already knows what you need. Now that causes many people to wonder, well, what's the point then? And as soon as you ask that question, you're on the verge of an incredible breakthrough in prayer because you realize that the primary goal of prayer is not to get something. The primary goal of prayer is to know someone. The heart of prayer is what happens when you're in a room alone with the Father in heaven and you realize there's intimacy to be found with him. Oh, realize this. The most important thing in your, oh, most important thing in the world is not your family, not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, not your job, not your finances, not your health. The most important thing in the world is your personal relationship with God, your personal intimacy with God. So Jesus says, set aside a time. In the words of Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, whatever's your best time of the day, give that to communion with God. Regardless of when, set aside a time, go to a place, go in a room, close the door, and pray. That one practice will revolutionize your life. Not just your prayer life, your life. Set aside a time, go to a place, and receive your reward. Jesus is saying the Father has so much for you. In the words of Charlie Dates, friend and fellow pastor of a church in inner city Chicago, prayer is not merely a way to get more things from God. Prayer is the way to get more of God himself. Oh, get this. God has invited you and me into a relationship that is characterized by intimacy, by what happens behind closed doors just between you and him. Oh. Then third, we pray to experience the power of being used by God, which we've already seen over and over again. God uses our prayers to accomplish his purposes. This is the way prayer is designed. We get the help. God gets the glory. So set your life up this way, the church up this way, so that when good things happen, it's clear God gave the help and God receives the glory. So who do we pray to? We pray then like this, our Father in heaven. That's huge. We pray to God our Father. You know what's interesting? That title for God Father, it's only used 15 times in the entire Old Testament, and none of those references are praying to God as Father. You get to the New Testament, though, Jesus comes, God is addressed as Father in the Gospels alone 165 different times. And all but one of those times is when Jesus is telling those who follow him, his disciples, about God. So the picture in the New Testament is that followers of Jesus, this is a title. We have the right and honor and privilege and blessing of using for God. When we pray, we don't talk to God or about God in some theological monologue of high-sounding pious phrases. We don't just pray, Almighty God, feared God among God's dreadful creator, ground of all being. Like he is so many things, but we have the privilege of coming to God and saying, Father. Uh, dad. He's not an impersonal ground of all being. Like he's our father. That's why I put this great quote from J.I. Packer about knowing God as your father, being in essence the definition of a Christian's life, then all these different places, and just the opening pages of the New Testament where God is called our father. Now think about the contrast with earthly fathers here. Jesus points this out in Luke 11 near the end of that passage. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I'm a father, I love my kids, but I'm also a sinner. So Jesus points out that when it comes to God as father, even the best fathers on earth, we are evil, but God is perfectly good. We have limited wisdom. God our Father has infinite wisdom. We have imperfect love. God our Father has perfect love. Just think about what the Bible says about the care of our Heavenly Father. He loves us, 1 John 3, 1. He understands us. He forgives us. He provides for us. Uh, I think about Matthew 6's exhortation, not to worry, transforms our prayer lives. The beat, he said, do not grow weary in prayer because a good God is listening who does not fear man and will respond out of his goodness to provide for his people. As our Father God disciplines us, He leads us, He indwells us, He lives in us by His Spirit. So think about our Father to whom we pray. Our Father has all authority. The earth belongs to Him. He has all supply. He has all sovereignty over all things. Our God, is, our Father has all authority, and our Father is always approachable. So you look in Luke 11, and you see Jesus teaching on prayer there. So He tells a story. It's back up in your study guide 
Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will arise and give him what he needs. This is a great, great story. Get the picture. First century Palestine, food not quite as readily available as it is today, is today. so no late night Taco Bells, battle for bread every day. You bake enough to meet that day's needs, then it's gone. So a guy shows up at his buddy's house at midnight, and he's hungry. Now, in first century Palestine, hospitality is huge. The buddy has a dilemma. One option, he can be a poor host and not get this guy any food. His second option is to go try to find bread from somebody else at midnight. So it's either be a poor host or a poor neighbor. So he takes what's behind door number two. His neighbor, already fast asleep, enjoying his dreams, not only asleep, but everybody in the house is asleep. Houses in that day were one-room affairs. That meant everybody in the family slept in, you got it, one room. So the family would sleep on the same... Sometimes in the same bed, same mat. I can just picture our family. All right, you get kid one, kid two, kid three, kid four down. Then you and the wife bolt the door closed. And you lay down next to each other. Like nobody's getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom without causing major composi- commotion in the scene. Everything's quiet, and especially if you got like toddlers, babies, like once a, like do not make a sound. <laughs> so while this guy, his four kids, his wife are nice and asleep on the mat, all of a sudden a knock comes to the door. The guy outside says, friend, which is a good way to start when you're waking up somebody at midnight for a piece of bread, because friendship's walking a tight line at this point, because when the dad wakes up, I just picture, you just see these little eyes start opening on the mat. It's one thing to wake up dad. It's a whole other ball game to wake up the kids in the middle of the night. This friend thing is seriously in question. So the guy inside, not too happy right now, and he says in the most polite way possible, don't bother me. I'm not getting up and giving you a thing. Then Jesus says, even to go, the guy won't get up because he's his friend. That's in question. He will get up because the guy is impudent. The word there means bold, literally shameless. He keeps asking until the dad gets out of bed and gives him some bread. So here's the interesting thing about parables. We hear them and we think, okay, somebody in the parable is me. Somebody in the parable is God. So the disciples are thinking, I think we're like the guy knocking on the door. Okay, so who's God? Like the grumpy guy inside yelling, don't bother me? Like, it's weird. What is Luke 11 teaching about prayer? If you want something from God, you just keep banging on the door. Eventually he'll get up and do something for you, not because he loves you, because you've bothered him to death. Let's pray. So... <laughs> Is that the point of the story? I don't think it is. The point of the story goes back to this boldness, this shamelessness. Some translations say annoyingly relentless. We'll only understand the parable rightly if we view it through the lens of the guy on the outside in need. Jesus tells the whole story from that guy's perspective. So you've got to keep his perspective the whole thing. Don't compare God and the guy inside. Just put yourself in the guy outside's shoes. Jesus phrased the whole thing as a question. He says, imagine if you were bold enough, shameless enough to go to your friend at midnight just to ask him for a piece of bread. In other words, imagine somebody with enough nerve, knock on his friend's door at midnight just for a piece of bread. I think the picture Jesus is painting of a guy who's, in a sense, just rude. One of the guys who doesn't, those guys who doesn't know which social lines to cross, which ones not to. You know that kind of person? Are you that kind of person? You probably don't know it if you are that kind of person. Anyway, the guy <laughs> doesn't seem to get the hint. Like, you don't wake up your buddy and his entire family at midnight unless you got a really good reason. This guy doesn't know that. He's shameless. He's so socially out of it. He thinks it's no big deal to wake up his friend at midnight. He won't mind. He needs some bread. He's got it. So... Jesus says that's how we should approach God. This story is a perfect illustration of us going to God and saying, think about it. I know it's inappropriate to, feels a little inappropriate to interrupt you because you're like running a universe and uh, you got a lot of things going. Think about how bold prayer is. God, you got a lot going on right now. But I, I got a few things in my life that I need you to pay some attention to. And I just need to share some things with you. So I need you to give me your attention. That's over the top, isn't it? feels pretty bold, almost shameless. And Jesus says, be as bold, shameless as you want. Like you are invited to come before God. I think Jesus is saying here that God delights in revealing himself to those who are bold enough to bother him. And I hesitate to use that word because we usually think of bother in a negative connotation. Nobody wants to be a bother, but think about this with me. If I'm I'm traveling somewhere and uh, I call home and I'm talking to my wife and she has something heavy on her heart and uh, so I say, hey, how are things going? And she's like, ah, there's some things going on, but I just don't want to bother you with that. Let me tell you what I'm not going to say. Well, good. Because <laughs> the last thing I need right now is you bothering me with things that are heavy on your heart. So if you have anything else, let me know. Otherwise, I'm, I, <laughs> there's so, so many reasons I'm not going to say that in that moment. And the primary reason is because I delight in being the one she bothers with the things that are heavy on her heart. Like it would be an unhealthy thing in our relationship if she didn't share those things with me. 
This is a part of love relationship we experience. And this is the picture. God, the sovereign king of the universe, is your father, and he's given you full access into his presence, and he is asking you, he has designed you to bother him with the things that are heavy on your heart. Like, this is, this is amazing truth. God invites us to bother him anytime. It's never too early. It's never too late. And everything, like sometimes we think the things we're praying for may not be important enough to warrant mention in time with God. But look at this story. This is not an emergency. The guy's not saying, my wife's having a baby, or my wife's dying, my kid broke his leg, we got a robber in the house. He's in the middle of the night. He says, I want some biscuits. I like, talk about presumptuous. Would the friend die if he just waited till breakfast? Like, tell him to go to bed. He'll forget he's hungry. That's what we tell our kids. Right? Oh, but this is the beauty. Like, there's nothing too small. Our simplest prayers are not insignificant to God. Remember Nehemiah, strengthen my hands. Nothing too small, nothing too great. The Bible never cautions us about the size of our prayers. It's not about the size of our prayers. It's about the main, maintenance and the intimacy of a relationship. Like, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, present your request to God. You know what everything in, means in that verse? Everything. If God gave you all that you were asking for right now, what would you have? Like, you have not because you ask not. He is approachable. Our God, our Father is always active. That's what this guy thought. My friend's able. I know I have some bread. He's active. So the picture we need to see, God is never asleep. So when we pray, we're not trying to arouse a sleeping giant here. We don't have to wake God up. And, and it's really even a picture of intercession here, the privilege we need to embrace that we've already seen throughout Scripture. God has actually invited us to participate with him and his provision for others through prayer. And as we pray, prayer to God is never, ever, ever in vain. Never in vain. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find, Jesus says in Luke 11. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks will be opened. Now you read that and you might think, hey, I've asked for things and I've not gotten them, so what does that mean? Well, that leads to the next question, what do we pray for? Here's the twofold secret to prayer. Twofold secret of prayer. Based on what teaches here, Jesus teaches in Matthew 6. Everything we've seen in the Bible to this point. Twofold. One, make your wants God's wants. Psalm 37, desire what God desires. Delight yourself in him. He will give you, he'll put his desires in your heart. This is the mystery of intimacy. So in prayer, in that time when you go in your room and close the door, get alone with God, you begin to want what he wants. You begin to long what he longs for. This is key in prayer. If we skip this step, we miss out on the point of prayer altogether. And we can't go on to step two. So make your wants God's wants, and then step two, ask for whatever you want. So there it is, John 15, 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So what do we ask for according to Jesus' words? We ask for God's glory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's not an description of praise to God as much as a petition for God to be praised. God, cause your name to be praised in all the earth, to be hallowed in my life and my family and my church and the world. As the great God, the sovereign Father in heaven, the Holy One above all, the coming King over all, this is our consistent cry. Cause people to hallow your name. Bring people to submit to your kingdom. Enable people to obey your will. Enable me, my family, my church to obey your will. Cause the nations to obey your will and hallow your name. These are prayers God is calling us to ask that he will answer. Ask God for his glory. Ask God for his gifts. Give us this day our daily bread. God daily satisfies our hunger and God daily sustains our faith. Uh, we need to pray for our daily bread like Jesus taught us to pray. Which, let's be honest, many of us who live in a culture like, like I'm in right now, praying like this makes no sense to us. We are so well off that it doesn't make sense to pray for our daily bread. But that's exactly where the problem lies. We are people who have grown so accustomed to depending on our own things to satisfy us instead of God. We don't need to ask for daily bread. Most of us didn't ask for it today because we can take care of that on our own. God help us to see we can't. As I'm, I'm convinced I look at my own life state of Christianity and Western culture around me, one of the greatest reasons why we are so casual and flippant with prayer is because we actually, we've convinced ourselves we can sustain ourselves, and we can't. God alone can satisfy our hungers. God alone can sustain our faith. And prayer, prayer is the guard in our lives that keeps us from thinking that this world can give us what we want when only God can do that. So we ask God for his gifts. We ask God for his grace. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. We've obviously seen the need for confession of sin in prayer. Jesus, Jesus teaches us to pray. As such, here in ways that we experience his forgiveness continually and specifically, and as we confess sin, we experience God's forgiveness, which then leads us to extend God's forgiveness to others. And finally, we ask God for his guidance. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. God gives protection amidst temptation we face. He gives perseverance amidst trials we encounter. So 
With all that, here's some, just practically. So this is where I want to give you a specific, personal, practical kind of excursus, kind of a practical discussion of one way you can apply this in your daily life. And I just offer this to you under the banner of the acrostic pray. So this is an acrostic I've used in the past. We use here at McLean Bible Church just to encourage one another when it comes to what to do when we pray. All together, personally. So when you go in your room, close the door, pray to your Father in heaven. What do you do? We'll start with P, praise. Worship God for who he is. Prayer starts with fixing our eyes, our hearts, our attention, our affections on God. I would encourage you to consider journaling. I'm just kind of a window in my own life, my time with God in the morning begins with, I mean most often begins with writing out prayers of praise, prayers of thanksgiving. And I would just say, and I'll mention journaling at a few different points. Journaling, I would say, out of, when it comes to spiritual disciplines, has probably been the single biggest factor in fueling intimacy with God in my own life. Uh, and it's just, it's enabled me to go uh, deeper in prayer, reflection on the word, uh, just in so many different ways. I'm not saying, there's not a verse that says you must journal, but I'm just saying practically encouragement, I would encourage you to consider journaling. I would also encourage you to consider different postures of prayer. So spend, th there should be, based on what we see in scripture, and we ran through the Psalms, but pictures of sitting, standing, kneeling, like spend time on your knees before God, raising your hands in prayer and worship, lying prostrate with your face to the ground. These should be familiar postures for all of us. I would encourage you to consider resources. Use musical, musical worship, like throw on some music. You're in the room alone. Sing as loud as you want. Shout. You might use prayer books like the Valley of Vision, excellent resource, or even just a hymn book that you can read. So spend time in praise, just worshiping God for who he is. Then R, repent, confess your sin to God, acknowledge your need for Jesus. Pause when you come before God, just ask, what in my life is not honoring to you? Just ask him, he will show you. Examine your heart, confess your sin. Oftentimes, I'll write this out. Again, considering journaling, writing out specific confession of sin. And as you do, write out specific promises of grace. Consider some of the same re re resources. Musical worship that expresses our need for God's grace. There are great prayers of confession and good, strong, biblically sound prayer books. Repent, then A, ask, intercede for specific needs in your life and others' lives. So yes, prayer is asking for specific needs in these ways. But our asking looks a lot different when we pray for what Jesus teaches us to pray for. So instead of God, here's a list of what I want, what we're asking for is actually what God wants. Ask God for his glory. Hallowed be your name. God, I'm asking for your name to be honored in my life, in this person's life, in that country, in this current event. Ask God for his gifts. Give us this day our daily bread. God, I need you for everything today. This person needs you for this today. Ask God for his grace, which we've already done, and repentance, for his guidance in your life and others' lives. So it's at this point, I would encourage, you, I would encourage just practically, just practical kind of side notes, consider some structure. So for me, I, I have specific kind of Prayer, uh, a prayer list basically that I use that's organized by day and person. I think about all the people I want to be intentional to pray for in my life. My family, these are great words from A.W. Pink. The most important duty, respecting both the temporal and spiritual good of your children, is fervent supplication to God for them. Without this, all the rest will be ineffectual. Means are unavailing unless the Lord blesses them. The throne of grace is to be earnestly implored that your efforts to bring up your children for God may be crowned with success. And I would say that it doesn't just apply to kids, but to spouse, to parents family, and others, for friends, co-workers, the church God's made me a part of, the lost in my sphere of influence. So I've got specific things I pray for my kids on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Specific things I pray for myself and Heather on those days. Specific things I pray for uh, co-laborers in the church. On the specific things I pray, different things for the church each day. So in all these ways, also praying by topics. So certain days, try to focus on prayer for the poor and hungry, the oppressed and the persecuted. So I hope that praying for the persecuted church is not a once a year thing for you. Why not be intentional about praying in some way every week for our persecuted family around the world? Pray for those in authority, peace among the nations, the unreached who haven't heard the gospel, current events and concerns. I would highly recommend just like the simplest one I use, the Joshua Project app. You can pray for a different unreached people group just every day. Every day it'll take you 60 seconds to intercede on behalf of people who've never heard the gospel. So I would just encourage you to plan how you can most faithfully play, pray on a regular daily basis. But in this, don't lose spontaneity. So don't be so chained to, uh, to a list or something that you don't stop and listen. As God brings people to your mind, you pray. As we listen, the Spirit will lead. I love those moments when God brings somebody to my mind, I just pray for them in that moment, and then shoot them a text or something. They say, you have no idea what I was going through, through when you sent me this text. Thank you. Or others don't have anything special going on. 
I'd be like, okay, thanks. But it's still good that you prayed for him. It doesn't hurt. So be, so ask, ask. I just think if God's given us this privilege, let's be intentional in maximizing it. So that's just some practical encouragement. To ask for what you just told us to ask for in our lives and others' lives, all this leads to yield. Surrender your life to following Jesus wherever and however he leads you. Remember how the Lord's Prayer closes. And lead us. God, lead us. So what I'll try to do in my time with God in the morning is pray through the details of my day. So I just pray for the people I'll be around. That I, or at least all the things I think I'll be doing, I'm planning on doing. Obviously knowing that some things can change, often do change. But even that, make sure to surrender your schedule. God, please and lead and guide every schedule change today. And having this time with prayer in the morning, at the start of my day, is huge for, well, I put in your study guide, let concentrated time in prayer fuel continual time in prayer. Because when you have this time with God at the start of the day, it just fuels conversation with God all throughout the day. It leads you to be more sensitive to opportunities to pray with others. Pray before God. Flash prayers like we were talking about earlier. Let personal prayer before God transform corporate prayer with others. And finally, let communion, conversation with God, lead to proclamation of the gospel. So pray, specific, pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Pray for boldness to speak the gospel when those inev- opportunities inevitably arise and pray for people to believe. Pray, P-R-A-Y, praise, repent, ask, yield. You have personal, practical time like this in the morning. I think you begin to experience a ton of what we've seen in God's word so far. God teach us to pray and to fast. So after teaching on the reward of prayer in the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew, Jesus jumps right into teaching on fasting for reward. He says, when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces. The fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say, they have received their reward. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who's in secret, and your Father who's in secret will reward you. So hear that language. Jesus says to his followers, when you fast, not if you fast. He assumes they will fast. Matthew 6 makes clear, fasting is basic to following Jesus. Fasting is as basic as giving, beginning of Matthew 6, as basic as, as prayer in the middle there, when you give, when you pray, then he follows this by saying, when you fast. So we don't ever see praying or giving as optional in following Jesus. They're basic to following Jesus. So why have we not seen fasting in the same way? We need to see fasting as a basic, elementary, given practice for any follower of Jesus. Jesus teaches that fasting is basic to following him. Fixed, fasting is fixed on seeking the Father. Jesus makes clear we do not fast so that others might see us, think we're spiritual in some way. We fast so we might know God. There is reward to be found in it. Fasting is feasting on fellowship with God. Feasting on fellowship with God. Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now with all that said, we get to Matthew 9, and we learn that Jesus' disciples weren't fasting. And religious leaders were wondering why not. So read what happened. Why disciples of Jesus didn't fast then, Matthew 9? The disciples of Jesus came to him, disciples of John came to him, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they they will fast. No one puts a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put in old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so both are preserved. What does that mean? Jesus is saying that you don't fast when the bride and bridegroom are together. All throughout the Old Testament, God had been promising that he would come as a husband, a groom for his people, his bride. Jesus was the fulfillment of that promise. After a thousand years of waiting, the king had finally come. So Jesus said, now is not the time for fasting. But that then leads to why disciples of Jesus fast now. And the answer from Matthew 9 is clear. Jesus, the groom, is no longer here. Acts 1, he has ascended into heaven, and we are waiting, longing for his return. And those who celebrate the ascension of the king now crave the consummation of the kingdom, which is why we fast, which is why we periodically set aside food and we pray, because more than we want our hunger to cease, we want his kingdom to come. And more than our stomachs long to be full, our souls long to see Christ. So think about it. This is a humbling thought. When you think about how so little of us fast, so little of our churches emphasize fasting, If one of the reasons we fast is because we long to be reunited with Jesus, to see him, for him to return, then if we don't fast, what are we saying? We're saying we're content with him not coming back. We don't long for his return. May it not be so. Let's fast. Let's express our longing for his return. And as we do, we realize why disciples of Jesus won't fast in eternity. Because once Jesus comes back, Revelation 19 gives us this picture in heaven. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let's rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage. 
marriage supper of the Lamb. One day we will be with our king, our groom, as his bride, and we will be with him forever, which means we will have no need to fast. So we pray and we fast. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And for as long as you tarry, teach us to fast in anticipation of your coming. We'll talk more in a few minutes about practical tips for fasting. We'll do excursus on fasting in the last section after we've seen a couple more passages. For now, we move on to Matthew 9, praying for laborers, a baffling passage when Jesus sees the crowd, harassed and helpless. He says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly, the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. The conditional lost, see their size, feel their suffering, realize their separation. This picture here of a harvest used throughout Scripture in reference to judgment. I put numerous examples there in your study guide. So the picture is multiple multitudes of people under the judgment of God in need of good news about the grace of God. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. They are waiting to hear. The problem is there are not enough workers. So how does this change? Pray. Earnestly, Jesus says, for the Father, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into the harvest. The commission of Christ. Jesus beckons us to pray, and then Jesus summons us to go, which is what happens right after this in Matthew 10. So it starts with prayer. Like God, even right now, we pray that you would send out more workers into the harvest. Like we're going to do this right now. We pray that you'd send out more workers in harvest fields right where we live, right around where all of us are gathered right now. Send out your people. Send us out as workers laboring for the harvest, sharing the good news of your grace, your salvation from coming judgment. And God, we pray that you would send out more laborers, particularly in the places where there are no laborers, where there are hardly any Christians. I think about the Kapali people of Bangladesh. There are no Christians, none there. Oh God, please send laborers to the Kapali people in Bangladesh and thousands of other people groups like them. We pray that you would send out laborers from among those gathered tonight for Secret Church. I pray that you would send out laborers from among us who will go to harvest fields where there are no laborers. Jesus, you told us to ask for this. We are asking according to your word, and you tell us that we have what we ask when we do that. So we are asking for more laborers to go into the harvest field according to your word and your name. God, raise up missionaries from Secret Church tonight who will take the gospel to the nations, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That leads to Matthew 14, praying with faith, feeding of the 5,000, so many takeaways from this story as we realize that Jesus who performed this miracle in Matthew 14, his spirit dwells in you. That means the compassion of Jesus is in you. The resources of heaven are available to you to call upon him. The plan of God is to use you in ways that are far beyond you. So make these ties to prayer as we pray. Prayer unlocks Jesus' compassion in you, opens heaven's resources to you, and prayer involves you and God's plan to bless others. Matthew 17, beholding God's glory, the transfiguration. Jesus goes up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John. Jesus meets with Moses and Elijah. We learn that God reveals his glory in the face of his son. As we read earlier in the night, Moses had reflected divine glory. Elijah had proclaimed divine glory. Well, now Jesus reveals divine glory. He radiates the splendor of God, unveils the presence of God, embodies the pleasure of God, speaks the word of God. He is the prophet promised by Moses. The Father sent Jesus to deliver his people from sin. He's the messenger preceded by Elijah, talked about in Malachi. The cross of Jesus paves the way for prayer that beholds the glory of God. Keep going, Matthew 22, for the love of God. Or we see what we saw in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, greatest commandment made clear from the mouth of Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. See this. Our wholehearted pursuit of God is our divine duty. We are commanded to love God. And this is a great, glorious command because at the same time, a wholehearted pursuit of God is our deepest delight. Just think about it again because it's the thing we're seeing over and over again tonight. We have been created for a relationship with God, Mark, first and foremost by what? Love. Love. God, help us to experience this a relationship with you marked first and foremost by love. Mark 9, help my unbelief. Our confession and prayer, I believe. We pray because we believe. At the same time, our cry and prayer is help my unbelief. We want to believe more. We pray because we have faith that God hears. At the same time, we want more faith. We want to grow in faith. And the more we pray, the more our faith grows. I love this prayer from, this quote from Andrew Murray. Beware in your prayers above everything else of limiting God, not only by unbelief, but by fancying that you know what he can do. Expect unexpected things above all that we ask or think. Each time before you enter, say, be quiet first. Worship God in his glory. Think of what he can do, how he delights to hear the prayers of his redeemed people. Think of your place and privilege in Christ and expect great things. The more we pray, the more our faith grows, and the more God's provision flows. In the words of Martin Luther, God is like an eternal, unfailing fountain. The more it pours forth and overflows, the more it continues to give. God desires nothing more seriously from us than, when, than that we ask him for much and great things. Oh, God, we believe, help our unbelief in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Mark 11, a house of prayer. So I want you to picture a sandwich here in Mark 11 with two pieces of bread and some meat in the middle, all right? So two pieces of bread. It's the beginning and end of this passage, Mark 11, 12 through 14, and Mark 11, 20 through 26, where Jesus teaches us that we pray with faith according to God's word and with forgiveness for others in the world. So we don't, we don't dive into that in depth, but I want you to see the meat in the middle. So you can look at those the pieces of bread and see how they relate. But then look in the middle. They came to Jerusalem. He entered the temple, began to drive out those who sold and those who brought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold, sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So this is the cleansing of the temple. What we saw early in the Old Testament had been set up as a house of prayer. So Jesus is clearly teaching us to pray with a desire for the holiness of God in our hearts, what the money changers and pigeon sellers were totally missing. Pray with reverence for the greatness of God in our lives. And then Jesus, quote, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So pray with zeal for the glory of God among all nations. Remember that passage from Isaiah 56? About God's design for the temple to be a place of worship for all nations? And the people of God had totally missed it because they had set up shop. You'll never guess in which court. Not in the court of Jewish men, court of Jewish women, in the court of the Gentiles. They'd taken the one place where the nations had come and behold the glory of God, and they'd turn it into a marketplace. They were serving themselves and basically saying to hell with the nations, and it incensed Jesus to holy anger. You put all this together and you realize the point is faith in God yields fruit for God through lives of prayer for his glory among the nations. Lives of prayer, praying with faith according to God's word for forgiveness with others in the world, with a desire for God's holiness, reverence for God's greatness, and zeal for his glory. God, help us to pray like this. Next, I included the Gospel of Luke as a whole to illustrate Jesus' example of prayer, which Luke in particular helps us to see. Jesus was always praying, which should tell us something in Spurgeon's words, though infinitely better able to do without prayer than we are, yet Christ prayed much more than we do. Just see Jesus' example of prayer. We'll go pretty quickly here. Prayer precedes Jesus' anointing for ministry, prioritizes. Jesus prioritizes withdrawing for prayer amidst ministry. Jesus prays before choosing his disciples, prays for his disciples to understand who he is, is transfigured while praying. His prayers lead to the disciples' desire to learn to pray. Jesus prays for disciples' faith not to fail. Jesus instructs his disciples to pray that they may not succumb to temptation. Jesus prays for the Father to remove the cup of suffering and death for him. Jesus prays for the Father's forgiveness of those who crucify him. Jesus entrusts himself to the Father with a final prayerful breath. Lord, teach us to pray like you prayed. Then specifically Luke 2, waiting in prayer. Simeon shows us that prayer waits with sensitivity to God's spirit and confidence in God's word. So sometimes God calls us to wait in prayer, but it's not a passive waiting, it's an active waiting. It's not sit back and do nothing while we wait, it's expectant. Pray and pray and pray as we wait. And prayer that waits culminates in praise and worship. Similar picture we see in Anna. God, help us to wait in prayer which leads right into Luke 18, persevering through prayer. This picture of the judge, Jesus uses this parable to teach us that we pray constantly and confidently believing that God is absolutely just, God hears all our cries, and that God will answer in due time, which we've talked about. Exactly what we saw in Jacob. So in prayer, we wait with persevering faith and with eternal perspective. With eternal perspective. Robert Murray McShane, when Christ delays to help the saints, the saints now, you think this is a great mystery. You cannot explain it. But Jesus sees the end from the beginning. Be still and know that Christ is God. God, we pray for patience in prayer, which comes from humility in prayer. Luke 18, the key to prayer is humility before God. In the words of Robert Smith, the bigger we see God from a biblical perspective, the smaller we become in our own eyes. And the result of prayer is humility before others. God, we pray for humility in prayer. Luke 10, the priority of prayer. Three times in the Gospels we see Mary of Bethany. All three times, where is she? At the feet of Jesus. How about that as a description for your life? May you and I sit at his feet, Luke 10, 38 through 42. God, help us to choose the good portion. To do the one necessary thing will not be taken away from us. Help us to sit at your feet. May you and I fall at his feet as Mary did when her brother Lazarus died. And then may you and I worship at his feet. John 12, Mary pours out an extravagant offering of expensive ointment at the feet of Jesus. God, make us men and women who prioritize being at your feet, who realize that sitting at the feet of Jesus precedes serving in the world for Jesus. Three more texts in the Gospels. First, a summary of God-led prayer from John 14 through 16. Oh, by God-led prayer, I mean, well, just look at John 14. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is so great. We pray with the leadership of the Spirit, who Jesus is promising here. We pray in the name of the Son. We pray for the glory of the Father. Spirit, that's God-led prayer. With the leadership of the Spirit, in the name of the Son, for the glory of the Father. Keep going. We've already read in John 15, 7, we pray according to the word. And you look at the promises at the end of John 16. 
When you ask like this, when you pray like this, we experience full joy. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. We experience full joy when we experience communion with the Trinity in prayer, and God gives us what we ask. How awesome is this? So, excursus here on praying the Word. So what we tried to do all night long, I just want to encourage you to practically pray in this way. Under the leadership of the Spirit, in the name of the Son, for the glory of the Father, according to the Word. R.A. Tori, prayer that is born of meditation upon the Word of God is the prayer that soars upward most easily to God's listening ears. Ian Bounds, the Word of God is the food by which prayer is nourished and made strong. So I love this from Mueller. So many times people struggle to know what to pray for. Our minds so easily wander in prayer. Does that ever happen to you? Listen to Mueller. Formerly when I rose, I began to pray as soon as possible, but, as often, but I often spend a quarter of an hour to an hour on my knees struggling to pray while my mind wandered. Now I really have this problem. As my heart is nourished by the truth of the word, I am brought into true fellowship with God. I speak to the Father and to my friend, although I am unworthy about the things that he has brought before me in his precious word. So let reading the word drive you to pray the word in all the ways we've already seen. As you read, read the word, P-R-A-Y, praise, worship God for who he is. Read a text, how does it lead you to praise and worship God? What does it lead you to thank God for? How does it lead you to repent, to confess your sin to God, acknowledge your need for Jesus? How does it lead you to intercede for particular needs in your life, others' lives, to surrender your life to following Jesus wherever and however he leads you? John Piper said this well. Praying over the word has the effect of shaping our minds and hearts. So we desire what the word encourages us to desire, not just what we desire by nature. That's why the prayers of Bible-saturated people sound so different. Most people, before their prayers are soaked in Scripture, simply bring their natural desires to God. In other words, they pray the way an unbeliever would pray who is convinced that God might give him what he wants. Health, a better job, safe journeys, a prosperous portfolio, successful children, plenty of food, a happy marriage, a car that works, a comfortable retirement, etc. None of these is evil. They're just natural. You don't have to be born again to want any of those. Desiring them, even from God, is no evidence of saving faith. So if these are all you pray for, there's a deep problem. Problem. Your desires have not yet been changed with the glory of Christ at the center. So just a side note, this is why we started a podcast called Pray the Word that I would offer for your encouragement, edification, I hope. It's just a three to five minute podcast where I take one verse or short passage from a chapter of Scripture, read it, make a couple comments, and then just let it lead into pray. I want to help people pray the Word because this is where the promises of God are unleashed in our lives. So if that'd be helpful, you can use it. I, I kind of laugh because uh, Heather, when I'm out of town, they'll, uh, she and the kids would... Uh, I started using Pray the Word and just uh, having like a devotional five minutes. Uh, and then when I came back in town, this is right when we started the podcast, they're like, uh, can we listen to Pray the Word? I was like, I don't have to listen to it. Like, you got the real thing, like right here. And uh, they're like, oh, I would rather listen to it. It stays at five minutes. So uh, anyway, <laughs> it's valid. It's valid. So anyway, uh, Pray the Word. Just a couple other practical suggestions. I would encourage you to pray with a journal in hand. I mentioned that already. And then praying, pray with the Word on your knees. On your knees. It'll, it'll change your prayer life. So God help us to pray your Word. Two more in the Gospels. John 17, Jesus pattern in prayer. Ah, oh, there's so much in all these. This is Jesus' prayer for his disciples and for us. Before he goes to the cross, it is breathtaking. In it we learn how the Father gives the Son authority to give eternal life. He gives him followers out of the world, work to accomplish in the world, words to proclaim in the world, his name, his glory. And in turn, the Son gives his followers, his disciples, then you and me today, eternal life, the Word of the Father, manifestation or revelation of the Father, glory from the Father. John 17, 20, 17 20, is mind-boggling. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. <laughs> Which leads to what the Son asks of the Father. One, to glorify him. Two, to keep his followers in his name. Three, to keep his followers from the evil one. Four, to sanctify his followers by his truth. Five, to unify his followers for his glory. Oh, just think, Jesus has prayed for all these things for us. So much to dive into there. But step back and see the big picture. Jesus' pattern in prayer. Some of you didn't get those. Keep his followers in his name. Sanctify his followers by his truth. Unify his followers for his glory. Jesus' pattern in prayer, as Jesus models for us at his most basic level, prayer is acknowledging God's gifts to us and asking for God's gifts for others. That, that's just a powerful, simple understanding of prayer. God, help us. Jesus, help us to learn from the way you prayed for us in John 17, the way you intercede for us even right now. And then prayer of surrender in Matthew chapter 26, as Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Very simply, prayer involves honesty in the face of sorrow, and prayer involves humility before the will of the Father. In the words of John O., a pastor friend of mine in inner city Atlanta, Jesus stared death square in the face, knowing his fate was inescapable. How did he face it? On his knees in prayer. So God help us to surrender our wills completely to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.